Okay, so today I'm speaking on uh, the problem with... This is mine, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So today I'm speaking on the problem with experts, science and scientism in the post-truth age. So for the last five years, we've heard frequent reference to the idea that we live in a post-truth age. Certainly in this time, the status of formal expertise has fallen, and experts increasingly find that to a sizable and growing minority, their very role as authorities renders them suspect, supposed agents of nefarious agendas. Among most sober-minded people, this state of affairs is viewed as something of an epistemic apocalypse, a cataclysm for Western culture and reason itself, as significant numbers of people not only irrationally, irrationally dismiss authoritative narratives and frames of reference and the technocratic authorities who produce them, but also turn instead to alternative and dubious sources of information, usually found online. In the social media age, algorithmically promoted authors are increasingly replacing institutionally curated authorities as the sculptors of our worldview, and indeed in many cases our self-image as a society. But at this stage it's worth noting that the word apocalypse in fact has two meanings. While we tend these days to use it as a synonym for cataclysm, its original meaning was more interesting. It meant the revelation of what has previously been concealed. In light of this distinction, in this talk I want to suggest that we might benefit from considering the post-truth age as apocalyptic, but in the original rather than the modern sense. It considers the possibility that far from being a sign of growing irrationalism, the loss of faith we are seeing in authority and expertise in general, instead perhaps reflects a growth in healthy, rational, and legitimate skepticism. Having done this, I want to propose how we may ensure that, in rejecting the insights of established authorities, the skeptical have a reliable alternative and do not then find themselves falling for alternative authors who, in truth, are nothing more than anti-establishment purveyors of nonsense, which is most of what's online. So in his fascinating 2009 book, The Master and His Emissary, the British psychologist and literary scholar Ian McGilchrist tackled the question of what makes the two hemispheres of our brain different and distinct. This is an old question and has, of course, elicited a number of competing theories. Some argue that the distinction is between science and art, others between the irrational and the emotional. Uh, still, as I've said, one side is the male brain, the other is the female brain. Adopting a less outcome-oriented approach, McGilchrist compellingly, I think, argues that the difference between the two hemispheres is simply in how they pay attention. The right hemisphere, what he terms the master, is interested in the contextual whole of things, while the left, what he terms the emissary, is instead concerned with the detailed content of the parts. <laughs> Put simply, evolutionarily, the left brain was for zooming in on detail, so when you are hunting or eating, for instance, while the, right, while the right brain is for zooming out to keep an eye on who may be hunting and wanting to eat you. While the terms master and emissary might seem to imply a hierarchy, McGilchrist argued that the two are in fact, or rather in a functioning brain should be, cooperative, not competitive. We of course need both abilities to zoom in on content, but also to keep an eye on context in order to live our lives. And we also see these distinctions manifesting in how we think and the roles we play in society. In the military, or indeed in business, or any organization, there's a distinction between what we might term tactical thinking and strategic thinking. The former dealing with details, the latter with context, assessing one's strategic priorities, given the broader picture of what is going on. Or take house building. Architects decide on the whole of the house in context, well, hopefully, whereas an engineer then arrives at the detailed structural decisions to realize the whole. But in, st in a, startlingly, a startlingly interesting leap, I think, from the evolutionary to the historical and from the psychological to the political, McGilchrist proposes that this distinction between a hemispheric concern for context or, and content explains certain patterns in human history. For he argued that when a culture prizes the way of seeing and paying attention of both hemispheres, that society will flourish. 
and in the periods of history where society has flourished, there's evidence of that. But in tracing the collapse of cultures, he notices a pattern in the art and literature of those cultures of privileging the parts over the whole, tactics over strategy, in a sense, engineering over architecture as a frame of reference. In such societies, he says, the contextual ways of paying attention, typical of the right brain, the master, are dismissed by society, and the society begins to be shaped by more left brain ways of thinking and seeing. Oh, it's bubbly, it's dangerous. And he sees this as something that we can, we can see occurring across contemporary Western society, uh, Western culture. A society and a culture which was once reasonably well balanced in its uh, uh, paying attention to detail and context, but is now increasingly technocratic in its worldview, literal in its understanding of language. And if you look at, for instance, a lot of the sort of woke stuff particularly, it's a very literal interpretation of language we're often seeing. Um, and, uh, and also given to thinking that all human problems are matters of objective facts that can be made explicit and thereby taught, rather than uh, our most fundamental problems in society being matters of subjective perspective, perspectives which are often dependent on what is implicit and revealed only to our intuition. All this brings us to the problem with some forms of contemporary expertise. We call people experts if they know a lot about a little. But the problem is, people who seek to know a little about a lot, enough to weave it all together, are not nearly as valued in contemporary Western culture. Someone who brings a specific fact is valued over someone who brings a general perspective. Someone with a broad view of the context, which is often a view encouraging restraint, caution, doubt, is not listened to nearly as much as someone with narrow expertise, who bears themselves with all the certainty and indeed fundamentalism that such blinkered understandings allow them. It is this performance of certainty and therefore authority that is so appealing to those in power and explains why they often seek out experts to legitimate policies and by extension their claim on authority. An expert can both, uh, can both legitimate, but they can also of course absolve the decision maker from any real responsibility when things go wrong. We were following the science or the expert advice is a sure way, if you say that, to get through a crisis without losing any political capital. So I've spoken about the difference here between content and context-oriented thinking in quite general and abstract terms. So what would be a, good few, a, a few good illustrative examples of this? Well, first, I think we can look at the discussion around climate change. The reason, of course, why climate change is a concern is because it's presumed to be of societal consequence. Indeed, there is a widespread presumption that the magnitude of climate change will dictate the degree of societal impact. In this sense, society is implicitly understood in this analysis in a rather classical mechanical manner, inclusive, I think, of the three laws of motion, if you think about it. First, it is implicit that society will remain as it is, as its status quo, unless acted on by climate change, or that it would remain as its status quo. That would be the first law of motion, for everyone who remembers the laws of motion from high school. Second, it is assumed that once acted on, the degree of societal impact will be proportional to the degree of climate change. And third, it is presumed that this impact will be proportionally disruptive, requiring an equal and opposite set of reactions from society to cope, which would be the third law of motion. So it's a very classical mechanical framing when we think about climate. It's the implied metaphor. Yet researchers suggested that the reality might be quite different once we take into account the nature of the societal context into which we care about the impact of climate change. And I should say my area of academic research is the societal impacts of climate change. In fact, for several decades, disaster risk reduction scholars have argued that there is, in fact, no such thing as a natural disaster. While there are natural hazards, wildfires, earthquakes, and so on, the degree to which they are disastrous is determined by social, political, and economic variables. The standard statement of this is as follows. Earthquakes don't kill people. What kills people is collapsing buildings. Thus, an earthquake of the same magnitude that strikes both Los Angeles, say, and Haiti will inevitably have a greater proportional impact in Haiti. This is because of differing standards of uh, building regulations and their enforcement, different levels of institutional corruption, and the different levels of emergency readiness, readiness and responsiveness, and political economic factors in general. The point is that it is not enough to know a lot about seismology or even about climate change in order to draw conclusions about their relevance to or impact on people. 
The human impact on any set, uh, of any set of environmental factors is always dependent on the conditions of the specific societal context and all its complexity. Thus, with climate change, the real question isn't, and this was mentioned in the last talk, actually, in the, in the questions, I think, um, isn't, is it happening or are we responsible? Those aren't the real debates. The real debate is, to what extent should we be focusing on climate change as the key variable in any analysis of the problems that beset people in a given societal context, even if climate change is happening, and even if our carbon dioxide emissions are causing it? So one of the basic truisms of the world is that if the people suffering some of the problems tend to be suffering all the problems as well. Indeed, the people in the third world, so-called, uh, context, whose problems were seen to do with, say, famine in the 1980s, or a lack of development in the 90s are precisely the people today who policymakers have in mind when they talk about potential climate migrants, for instance. When experts focus on the theme du jour, such as climate change, as a way of framing an analysis of human suffering, which I think is meant well, they arguably do the people in question, I think, a disservice. In focusing on the content of the particular theme, what is ignored and presumed to be a neutral backdrop are the cultural, political, and economic contexts that renders these people so vulnerable to processes such as famine or such as climate change. A second example, that's the climate example. The second example uh, of the problem of prioritizing content over context can be found in the now conclusively failed efforts at nation building in Afghanistan. The British writer and politician, and um, uh, someone I used to work for briefly actually, Rory Stewart, has argued that Western plans for nation building in Afghanistan were assembled using constellations of abstract jargon and buzzwords, with strategy documents on how this could be achieved, tending to be replete with generic thematic concerns, such as words like governance and achieving our vision through social compact and linking strategy to sectors and cross-cutting themes. But always, these documents are always devoid, if you read them, of any context-specific concepts. In that case, as he noted, and he read an entire 300-page report in which those are the phrases, but he word searched them for the following words, and they didn't show up in this document on Afghanistan. Pushtun, Hazara, Tajik, Islam, Sharia, Jihad, Communism, Northern, Al Northern Alliance, and Warlord. As Stuart notes, were you to delete the word Afghanistan from the document and replace it with the word Botswana, it would be very difficult to know of which country you were, to, you were speaking. And now speaking in the autumn of 2021, in the wake of the dramatic collapse of the Afghan state and the Taliban's return to power, it's clear that Stuart's concerns were pretty well founded. The technocratic interventions in Afghanistan, which were conducted in no small part by consultants educated at the management and government schools of the world's best universities, failed not because they did not understand the content of their own general theories of political economic intervention, but because they did not understand or sufficiently consider the real and particular cultural context in which these intervention, in those interventions would be made. And then a final example, inevitably, is COVID-19. The epidemiology and virology during the pandemic, I think, has been outstanding. It's been invaluable in understanding the nature of the virus and how to treat it. However, throughout the pandemic, we've heard political figures repeatedly claim that in all their policy decisions, particularly regarding so-called lockdowns, which is another word for house arrest, that they have been guided by the science. Yet the question of what restrictions are proportional in the face of a pandemic is not in fact a question science can answer. It is a question that is as much about subjective values and culture as it is about objective facts and data. What is the balance between lives and livelihoods? Is there more to life than the avoidance of death, as the Supreme Court Justice Jonathan Sumption, uh, Sumption uh, put it? What is an acceptable level of risk for a population to endure? What we're willing to endure in terms of risk is a highly cultural phenomenon. Indeed, each of us in this room will have a different sense of what is a, a, a risk that we're willing to endure. These are not scientific questions, but rather philosophical and, quite frankly, cultural ones. They're not about objective factual content, but about subjective societal context. And yet, throughout the pandemic, there's been a startling absence of dispassionate, rigorous, and, crucially, good faith debate and discussion on these questions. The cost of this lack of debate is, ironically enough, a matter of debate in terms of how significant it will be. But it is a debate that has barely occurred. 
and we are surely poorer for its absence. If character is revealed in a crisis, the pandemic has revealed a society that perhaps lacks the character for robust debate of our collective problems. Okay. Having laid out the assumption, the, the bias in our culture of focusing on content of context, and having illustrated the problem with the examples of climate change, Afghanistan, and COVID-19, I want to end by returning to the problem of post-truth. Arguably, a great deal of the reaction against elites and the establishment in the last few years is due to many people recognizing, however subconsciously, that there is something, that there is something wrong with the picture we are being sold by the so-called experts and the authorities. As again and again, the promise of that picture fails to manifest in reality, or when it does, simply doesn't fit the complexity of the real world and our real lives within it. As that picture is one that is simplistic and lacking a full appreciation of the broader context within which the given expert's factual content exists. Clearly, there is a need to evolve our thinking, as individuals, but also as a culture. But in what way? What sort of evolution or revolution are we looking for? And is there any precedent for doing so? And I think we can first turn, perhaps turn, to the history of physics for an example of the sort of transition we could think about. In 1687, Isaac Newton came up with the theory of mechanics, which obviously I've already referenced, which provided equations for how physical objects interact in space. In this theory, he had assumed that the context of everything in the universe, space and time itself, was static and neutral. That is, space and time are a fixed sandbox within which the events of the physical universe play out. Over 200 years later, Albert Einstein was trying to make sense of how it is possible that the subsequent discovery of the speed of light moving at a constant speed relative to everyone, regardless of how fast each person is traveling, and how that, he was trying to work out how to reconcile that with Newton's static space-time framing of classical mechanics. Einstein's solution is obviously very famous. His solution was to revolutionize the way we conceive the universe itself, and it fundamentally required him to overthrow Newton's assumption that space and time, the sandbox neutral background, were in fact static, neutral, and a background. He realized that space and time were dynamic, that they were a continuum, dilating and contracting relative to each other. Light can remain at a constant speed relative to all observers because the context within which light travels, space and time itself, distorts and warps, dilates and contracts. Perhaps in our understanding of society, indeed our understanding of ourselves, we need to take a similar sort of relative approach and have a, this sort of relative evolution in how we think. We need to see that cultural context is not simply a neutral backdrop to the study of the nature or impact of factual or scientific content, or a sandbox within which we play with scientific ideas, but is rather constitutive of and deeply implicated in everything we do and relevant to how we engage with all the content we know or presume to know. So to, to conclude, I think on time, um, I'd argue that the key to repairing the post-truth epistemic ruptures that are distorting the public sphere in liberal democratic society is to recognize that science is a tool for use, not a window on truth. By analogy, if you are building a house, you use tools to do so. But the question of how to make an aesthetically pleasing and comfortable home is not a question a tool can solve. Similarly, science is a tool that can help us build the society we want. But we cannot let science be the architect of society. Content should serve context. Things should serve people. Too often in our, our era, we're making the terrible category error of assuming that people can be understood and, and subsumed under the science and study of things, of inanimate things. This is what is, we call, and has already been mentioned here, this is what we call scientism. The assumption that scientific knowledge is the only form of knowledge, and thus a guide to what our values should be, rather than simply one form of knowledge, albeit a very useful one, which must then be understood in service of our values. What is called the post-truth era, far from being an epistemic apocalypse in the sense of a cataclysm, might better be understood as a revelation of something that has previously been concealed. Namely, that experts are perhaps not as reliable as authorities as we'd like to think, and indeed tend to think, in our culture that is so marked by pervasive scientism. Assuming this argument holds, the question becomes how we rebalance the culture to restore the place of context-oriented thinking. There are no easy answers to this. Some suggest changes to our politics. Others suggest that science and technology holds the key, and that with more data, we'll achieve more insight. I'm not so sure. <laughs>
The big data, the big data driven world inevitably does not see us as ends in ourselves, but means to ends, which are usually ends as cynical as they are reductive, usually as simple as simply a source of profit for the person setting the algorithm. And what of our politics? Well, it would seem that increasingly our politics today seems more constitutive or perhaps symptomatic of our problems than the means by which we cure them. The left and the right, if you look at the UK or the United States, um, see each other as the pathology and themselves as the cure. However, it would seem to me that whether we're talking about the Trumpism or the uh, movement or the woke movement, whatever you want to talk about, both are less pathologies or cures, but rather symptoms that show you there is a deeper pathology in need of a cure. I would argue that the true pathology is, in fact, the pervasiveness of scientism. And thus, in finding a cure, we might begin instead by simply changing how we think, uh, by restoring an appreciation of context in our increasingly content-hungry world, and in doing, reconsidering the place and role of science in society. This might be the only means by which we avoid both the scientism implied in so much contemporary forms of authoritative technocratic expertise, and the epistemic perversity of the alternative fact reactions that this scientism has elicited. The solution to the era of post-truth, therefore, is perhaps not a restoration of science to a place of absolute authority, but a recognition that science, is, that science itself can and should only ever be our emissary, not our master. Thank you very much. Q and A, everybody. Sorry, we're running a little late on time. Uh, once again, Callum Nicholson, no everyone. Cheers. Thank you.